Good morning, everyone. It, I will now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. It is Thursday, November 2nd, 9.01 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Peterson? Here. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Montesino? Here. Commissioner Hernandez was supposed to be joining us. Let me just make sure he's not on. Okay, let me just let him in. I'll come back to his name. Commissioner Cummings? I'm sorry, Commission Alternate Chifrin? Here. Commission Alternate Quinn? Here. Commissioner Koenig? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Here. Commission Alternate Pegler? Here. Commissioner Rotkin? Here. And Commissioner Hernandez? You're on mute, Commissioner Hernandez. You... It's here you. He's here. And I believe uh, Commissioner Hernandez is joining us under an AB 2449 Just Cause request. Commissioner Hernandez, can you unmute and state the nature of your request? Maybe not. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure you can Well, in that case, what are, if I might, um, Chair Koenig, uh, Commissioner Hernandez did speak to me about his request. He is out of town on business for a conference, and I believe that meets the requirements of AB uh, 2449. Okay, and is that uh, one of the requests that we have to vote on then to allow the commission? No, the commission can just accept the request since he's on official business for his agency. Okay, thank you, and I would trust that he'll be uh, fully connected to audio shortly. Executive Director Preston, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda today? No additions or deletions. We do have one handout. That's for item 23, and uh, that handout has been posted to our website. Thank you. We'll now proceed with oral communications. Any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to all communication, but in compliance with state law, it may not take any action on items that are not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. Uh, we do have a full agenda today, so we will take 10 minutes of public comment this morning. Good morning, Chair Koenig and morning. commissioners. My name's Matt Farrell. I'm here today speaking on behalf of Fort Friends of the Rail and Trail. We want to thank the Capitola City Council, uh, including commission Commissioners Brown and Peterson, for their vote on uh, Thursday night, October 26th, uh, approving the consolidated application for the Segment 10 and 11 draft EIR. And secondly, for the pedestrian and bicycle School improvements approaching the Capitola Village on Cliff Drive and ending on Monterey Avenue. Um, as I told the council on Thursday night, as a person who visits Capitola Village regularly on my bicycle, having these improvements will be a significant improvement to access for both pedestrians and bicyclists. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. So anyone else here in chambers that wishes to address the commission? All right, seeing none, we'll move to online comments. Start with Michael Saint. Okay, good morning, uh, Chair Koenig, uh, commissioners. Michael Saint with uh, CFST. Uh, last Wednesday, the 25th, I attended the public meeting in Watsonville on adopting county transportation network for a climate resilient future. To me, that implies projects approved presently should be climate resilient. It has been proven and studied for years that car eccentric projects and widening highways is not climate resilient. On the contrary, car eccentric projects are the catalyst that fuels greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. 60% of car greenhouse gas emissions in Santa Cruz County is caused by our transportation network. Hard to plan for a climate resilient future 
when you are widening highways and inducing more demand for single occupancy vehicles. Don't panic. There are ways to make our transportation network more climate resil resilient, more funds for mass transit, also reallocate funds from car eccentric projects to mass transit, make the Ox, Ox Lanes bus on shoulder a dedicated bus lane, and begin to build a mass transit system that will actually achieve congestion and reduce it on Highway 1. Lately, my interest in public uh, rapid transit or pod car technology is growing every day as it is being studied and implemented in several cities around the world. It's clean and sustainable, capable of carrying thousands of people an hour. Its infrastructure is flexible enough to avoid coastal erosion and sea level rise. We need to study more alternatives. We can choose to do something better. As John F. Kennedy said on September 12th, 1962, we choose to go to the moon. And the reason he did that, because it was hard. Six years, 10 months later, we were on the moon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Ryan Peoples. Hi, this is Brian Peoples with Trail Now. Um, you know, Mike just spoke from Campaign of Sensible Transportation. You know, Mike is a phenomenal guy. You know, just as an example, he, uh, when I broke my neck a year and a half ago, he called me. So, you know, he has a real value, passion for what he speaks to. And I, and I commend him for that. Um, but having said that, I get a little confused by the Campaign for Sensible Transportation and the efforts that they don't support, actively support, building the coastal trail now. You know, they don't, they, they don't mention that we're going to destroy thousands of trees building a trail next to the tracks. Um, we've only built one mile of it over a decade. Uh, Watsonville will never get a trail. Um, there's not enough money. So I, I just get a little confused that they come and, and speak to it. And they're the, they're the group that supported a no on 2016 Measure B, which has been phenomenal for our community. Absolutely, we would not be where we are if we didn't win that. And trail now supported that measure as a political action committee. So I, I'm, I'm tossing it back to Mike. And I think, like I said, he's a phenomenal guy, greatest guy, real value added person, wants the community to do better. So I'm challenging the Campaign for Sensible Transportation to be sensible on building the interim coastal trail now. Let's not destroy all those trees. Let's build it so we can have an alternative to automobiles. I never hear them commit, uh, commenting that we need to open the trail now. We need that option. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Next up, uh, Ms. Judy Gittleson. Hey, I'm Judy Gittleson of Watsonville, and I highly recommend that we prioritize the repairing and maintaining of tracks, both as an infrastructure to uh, exit from a climate crisis if necessary, and also to use the tracks or as a as a passenger rail and um i want to take uh 18 seconds of my time here to just uh demonstrate what it may sound like on a light rail and i'm in portland oregon and the light rail and it did sound like this so i'll come back in 18 seconds but this is the potential of what a train might sound like Thank you. I think that would be a wonderful contribution to our society. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you, Ms. Gittleson. Next up, Carrie. Yeah, hi. This is Carrie Pico from Aptos. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, and we can have okay. your slides First up. First of all, you. I've been in Portland, and uh, I would say the trains are more than silent. Um, there's a slide up there. I hope that you see it. We can see it. Thank you. And um, I, this is really going to be very short, which is my last time I was here, I spoke about 
uh, the, the granting clause issue and condemnation. I know at least one property owner has received a notice from the RTC that they're looking into the title that they may or may not own, uh, meaning they're going to do probably a, a, a quiet title search. And I'm pretty sure that RTC will discover they don't own it. And I just want to highlight, it's not just one property. There are properties up and down the, the corridor, and I've at least $200 million uh, will be have to be paid out uh, if you build a trail, assuming that every property owner joins some, uh, you know, one of these out-of-state law firms to do that. And, and probably I won't be one of them, uh, so this is not about me, and I'm just trying to save the county a couple hundred million dollars. So thank you. That's about all I want to say. Thank you, Mr. Pico. Next up is Barry Scott. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners. I just wanted to uh, um, show some appreciation again for all the fabulous grants that you've been getting and encourage uh, continued work on toward the ultimate trail design and a, a reminder along with Judy Gittles and uh, many of us are concerned because the 8% of 2016 Measure D is uh, toward rail maintenance. So much of it has been spent toward studies and and they keep telling us what we need to do next. I'm glad to see that we're kind of working on that. Um, I'm looking at a RTC page from February 13th, 2015, celebrating the completion of a complete reconstruction of the La Selva Beach Railroad trestle just eight years ago, 2015. Um, and so I encourage I encourage uh, the commissioners to uh, encourage staff to continue to look for grants and funding uh, packages that can go toward rail maintenance and uh, and eventually reconstruction of some of these bridges and trestles. And uh, again, good luck with all you do and thanks. Uh, thanks for everything. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Scott. All right, seeing no one else. Uh, all right, we have one more comment here in uh, in Chambers. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Jim Helmer, Ben Loman resident. I just wanted to um, express my gratitude um, to the commission and County Public Works. Uh, last year, there was quite a debate about um, street repairs. And um, I'm a resident on Alba Road. And Alba Road, uh, Jamison Creek, portions of Empire Grade Road in Bonnie Dune suffered extensive damage over the, over the last three or four years. Not just the fires, but all of the caravans of trucks <clears throat> addressing rebuilding and removal of debris. Um, I know it was a tough decision on what roads to fund, but uh, all that the San Lorenzo Valley has been through in the last few years, uh, we do, I speak for many, we appreciate. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. All right, so you know what else that wishes to address us, uh, we'll proceed with the uh, cons action on the consent agenda. Does any commissioner have questions or comments on the consent agenda? Seeing none. With the consent agenda. Second. All right. Motion by Commissioner McPherson. Second by uh, Commissioner Pegler. From the public. Seeing no public comment. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We'll now proceed with the regular agenda. Does any commissioner have a report to share? Mr. McPherson. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, just recently, uh, or yesterday, or for the last two days, I've been down in Las Vegas, uh, not going to the tables, but to enter a contract with Yellow Pine, along with Silicon Valley uh, 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 Sustainable Power. Uh, we uh, are, we signed a contract, thirty-year contract with uh, yellow, or twenty-year contract with Yellow Pine, to uh, procure uh, an uh, uh, electric energy that will eliminate uh, fossil fuels on our path to eliminate fo fossil fuels in this area by 2030, uh, 15 years ahead of the state target. 
And I feel very good about that. We have some great partners in that. And uh, Next Era Energy was there. Uh, Silicon Valley representatives were there. Um, it was an amazing thing. Uh, it's outside of, it's nowhere uh, from Las Vegas. Uh, and all you have to watch for is uh, uh, sheep and uh, snakes and so forth. Uh, but uh, it is quite uh, an impressive uh, facility that they have there. And it was really great. And to see us uh, moving forward in this aspect, as was said, that transportation takes a great deal, a majority of our fossil fuels that we have to try to eliminate and uh, we're ahead of schedule and we have a great, we have some great partners. And uh, this is, uh, I just want to say thank you to the three CE uh, staff that worked on this for many years to get, make this happen. It was a, a really a great event. It's one that's going to really help us in Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Uh, earlier this week, I had the opportunity uh, to join Executive Director Preston and uh, Sarah Christensen from our staff at the Focus on the Future conference uh, put on by the Self-Help Counties Coalition. It was a great opportunity to learn more about what other transit and transportation agencies are experiencing, um, how they're addressing some of the challenges that they're facing. Um, both Executive Director Preston uh, and uh, Ms. Christensen were on panels and did a great, uh, great job at sharing the things that we're we're doing here in Santa Cruz, uh, all the good work that's happening. And I think um, it was a really good opportunity uh, to show what's happening here in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Rockin. I just wanted to ask Bruce McPherson, is, was it a solar array that's bringing the power? What's the action? Yes, yes. They have solar panels. I've got some photos of it. It just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's All right, seeing no other comments. Um, I do have a resolution here in appreciation of our retiring executive director. Uh, it is Director Preston's last meeting with us. And uh, Guy has had a long and illustrious career in transportation planning, programming, engineering, and project delivery, 34 years in the business, and has been with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission for almost exactly five years now, since December 2018. During Guy's tenure, uh, the RTC has secured over $150 million in grant funding for a variety of projects, capitalizing on Measure D funds approved by Santa Cruz County voters in 2016, and really taking advantage of the sustainable, multimodal, and comprehensive uh, expenditure plan that was passed in association with Measure D. Mm -hmm. And also during Guy's tenure, the RTC has initiated construction on the Highway 1 41st Avenue to SoCal Drive Auxiliary Lanes project, completed storm damage repairs on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line right-of-way, and completed an extensive right-of-way phase for the North Coast Rail Trail, preparing the project for construction. And throughout uh, all of this, Mr. Preston has served the RTC with professionalism and dedication. Uh, and I will just add, that guy, you really have uh, done fantastic service for this organization and this county. You've helped us navigate some difficult times with mm -hmm. honesty uh, and really a great deal of attention to the facts. And I think you've helped uh, explain a lot of challenging and complex situations to, to many of us, uh, as well as to the public. So, uh, and you've also helped shift this organization. I mean, as was as mentioned in the uh, resolution here, uh, from one that was mostly conceptual and planning to one that's actually delivering some really large projects um, and, of course, help to secure the, the funds from uh, state and federal sources to deliver those projects. So just cannot thank you enough. Glad that you, although retiring, are still going to be in the area and uh, be available for some informal consultation from time to time. Um, one quick question. Um, this is in the form of a resolution. I know it's not formally listed on the agenda, and I've got uh, some, some spots here for, for eyes and nose um, as far as a vote. Can we actually vote on approving this resolution? In the recognition, but if it's not on the agenda, you shouldn't vote on it today. Okay, well, maybe we can. But, they, but you can add it to the next agenda. This uh, resolution to the agenda item. This is a direct Any further discussion? Any public comment on this? All right. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 
Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that passes unanimously. So now we can not only praise you, but um, have the opportunity to officially recognize you with this resolution. Any further comments from commissioners on this topic? Commissioner Schifrin? Well, if this is a time to say what I think about the uh, current executive director, that I just want to very personally thank God for the incredible work on the commission. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to thank you for the incredible work you've done over a very trying period over the time for the for the commission over the time. Some of the time you've been here, not all of the time, and uh, lesser souls would have uh, abandoned ship a lot earlier in terms of the kinds of controversies that we've had and uh, the 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 strength of feelings in the public on different sides of the issue, and you st stood in the middle, uh, and I think respected by both sides. Um, for your willingness to proceed with uh, what the commission directed you to proceed with. So not only have you been incredibly successful in bringing uh, millions of dollars of improvements to the county, but you've survived and um, really played a very positive role from my perspective in steering this ship through very troubled waters. So from my perspective, you're really going to be missed. Uh, and I really do want to thank you for all the work you've done for the commission. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've served with um, Linda and George and um, Guy. They were, they were great, but I think uh, you were superlative. Uh, you know, there's so many, when you look up at the dais here of, of who is represented, um, it's a diverse group. And it's a lot of times it's like herding cats, but uh, I say that in a nice way. Um, and what you've done to navigate that and to come through and be action oriented and provide real transportation solutions, which isn't always easy because a lot of studies that happen here, right? And a lot of uh, reports and everything, but to actually get things done is not always easy. And so for that, I'd like to uh, compliment you and uh, wish you uh, Godspeed on your future, wherever that takes you. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Thank you. Um, well, I would echo the comments from my colleagues here about your uh, your capacity, your your dedication and and expertise and all you have brought to the commission um, and, and the commission's work. I want to add that um, personally, as um, you know, coming in as chair, I um, felt like I was a little bit in over my head. And, and um, even though I had been on the commission for a few years and uh, getting to work with you and talk with you more often and um, more in depth was um, really a turning point for me in understanding, better understanding the um, transportation funding framework, um, you know, all the way from the planning and resources to construction and your engineering uh, lens um, really helped me see our, um, what we're doing in a different light. Um, or in a more holistic light. And so I just want to thank you for your your willingness to work with us, um, you know, to to help us understand the intricacies of uh, the decisions we're making and um, just being, you know, enthusiastic and, and making transportation work fun. <laughs> so um, just just so appreciate the time we've had uh, here with you at the RTC and look forward to uh connecting in the future as well. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner yeah. McPherson. Yeah, I would repeat everything that's been said and um, just point out and probably what could be the most contentious times in the transportation subject matter of Santa Cruz County. You have brought a calmness and uh, a direct, a solutions oriented uh, address to us to say this is how we can do it or this is what can be done and what can't be done 
Uh, we didn't we needed that more than ever. These contentious feelings are still among us in Santa Cruz County, but uh, I think that if people listen to you and and what you're al uh, allowing us to uh, uh, digest of what's what can be done and what can't be done or what this grant is for and what it can do, um, we're very very thankful for that. So um, in some of the most difficult times, you made them uh, our most productive times, and you're to be credited for that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rockin. I just um, really appreciate the comments my colleagues have made and agree with them all. The only thing I would add is I've been particularly impressed with your ability to, and willingness to meet with individual commissioners and members of the public, take a tour of the rail, you know, with people. It makes such a difference, you know, when you actually go out and look at things and um, rather than simply coming to meetings or, you know, carrying out the minimum uh, aspects of the job. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've been so successful with your leadership, uh, huge divisions in this County, maybe bigger than anything else that we've had. have really, they haven't been healed completely. People still disagree about things, but there's been a kind of civility brought to this discussion about things. That's very different than what was going on before you, you got here. And so I just really want to appreciate that the time you've taken to, you know, sit down in an hour meeting, an hour and a half meeting, a, a three hour trip along the rail to see what's, you know, what actually are the constraints that we're talking about um, really made a difference for me. And I think for other people as well. So really want to appreciate the way you've handled this job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. Commissioner Montesino. Yes. Um, well, we recently had lunch together and unexpectedly. We ended up at the uh, same restaurant, but um, really, uh, 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 you know, want to appreciate your integrity, um, you know, in all aspects. You know, every time you, uh, um, you've taken our calls or you know, um, and and really put, uh, you know, our, our questions to the forefront and explain things to, uh, um, uh, to us in the community. I think that uh, shows a lot, uh, shows a lot, you know, uh, about you and what and what you're uh, and what you're about, and we will be greatly miss. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kristen Brown. Thank you. Uh, I'll just echo what's already been said. Um, I came on to this commission at a rather tumultuous time. Uh, and one of the first things um, when I was appointed by uh, Capitola City Council to join the RTC commission was you reached out and invited me to be a part of a tour of the rail line, which I found very helpful and very kind. Um, since that time, you've taken all of my calls, been willing to meet every time I had questions, um, brought a lot of clarity to a lot of the things that, as previously mentioned, we um, address a lot of really technical and complicated and complex issues. And uh, having your kind of voice of guidance has always been so very helpful, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, you will you will be missed, uh, but we wish you all the best. And I think ultimately, just thank you for your service, not just to our board, but to our entire community. It's really the county residents that are benefiting from the decisions that are made here under your leadership. And so, thank you again, and wish you the best. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. I'm not elected, never been elected. But nonetheless, Guy afforded me the right to ask ridiculous questions and direct me to the right data to draw my own conclusions. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no other comments by commissioners, I'll open it for public comment. Does anyone in the audience wish to comment on this resolution of appreciation for our retiring executive director? Hi, Sarah Christensen of your staff. Um, just want to highlight a couple of things that Guy did. Um, I think that, you know, we're really lucky to have had him for the time that we did. And I just want to, um, you know, for the community, the greater community, this commission and staff as well. Um, he provided balance and empathy. He led us through the pandemic. Um, that was really hard. He led us through a lot of change. Um, and overall, um, you know, generally provided a lot of leadership and bridged the gap when there was uh, differing opinions in the community, on the commission, and even with staff. Um, he, I just want to highlight the uh, strategic implementation plan for Measure D. That was a huge thing. Um, it, the second 
strategic implementation plan is on the, on the agenda today, and he's passed the baton to Tommy Travers of our staff, which is great. Um, and um, that SIP provided uh, the framework to really stretch our dollars, and that's there's a lot of value there. Um, and with that, he's you know built trust and delivered on the promises made by Measure D, and that's a huge deal. Um, so with that, I just want to say um, thank you for your mentorship and um, thank you for everything you've done for this community. So, Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Anyone else here in the audience? I think we have a couple comments online. Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. I'll just keep it short and thank Guy for the phenomenal work he's done. Um, and um, just what everybody has said is true. We're very fortunate that we have you. And, and, and I'll actually say it, that we're more unfortunate that you're leaving after only three years. Um, and, I, and as everybody knows, we blame this dysfunctional board and the fact that they didn't support Guy Preston in his guidance on rail banking, and they put Roaring Camp, a private company, an individual, Ms. Clark, over the community. And again, I'm not going to leave it on a negative, but Guy, you did phenomenal work um, uh, and appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. And uh, we are looking at, we've had Director Preston for five years. Mr. Sain. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd be remiss in uh, not offering Guy a well, uh, I guess you could say, best of luck in the future as well as his retirement. I hope he enjoys that. Uh, he's had to listen to me for five years now, almost every month. And um, that's not an easy thing. If you'd ask my wife, she would also agree. Um, I think not having agreed on a lot of things and parts, parts of the planning process is normal. Uh, I think Guy was uh, very, uh, held things close to himself. We didn't really know how he was thinking, but he was there uh, to work for the RTC board and do what they voted on. And uh, he did an excellent job, lots of integrity in that area. My last director was Mr. Don Darrow. He kind of wore his uh, thoughts on his sleeves quite often, and it was pretty easy to <laughs> know what he was thinking. But the guy did a great job. I do appreciate you and your staff for all the funding you've come across uh, to help us try to get our transportation network uh, back to some form of going forward. Thank you again. Enjoy your retirement and be safe on that bicycle. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Seeing no further comments, I'll return it to the Commission for Action. Move the resolution. Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Schifrin, second by Commissioner Kristen Brown. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, excellent. Um, any opposed? Any abstentions? That motion passes unanimously. Um, so, I will just ask, uh, since we do need to, I think, uh, record the uh, the eyes and sign this, and then we'll get it to a nice frame. Uh, and if I, could, I would ask the commissioners to just, just stick around for a minute after the meeting so we could take a photo with Dr. Preston. All right. Uh, we'll, we do have a public hearing at 9.30 a.m. I think we're probably running about uh, 15 minutes behind schedule. If you're here for that public hearing, we will be getting to the item shortly for the Measure D five-year program of projects. Um, but for now, we'll proceed. Uh, with um, a couple of reports. First, I'll just say that uh, we are going, I, I will convene a selection of chair committee if uh, to select our chair for this commission for the uh, coming year and the vice chair. If you're interested in participating in that, please reach out to me uh, and we'll form that committee. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Executive Director Preston for his director's report. Uh, thank you, Chair Koenig, uh, fellow commissioners, and um, uh, the public for all of the kind comments that you just made. Um, I'm going to start my report um, with a few announcements um, before making my parting comments uh, here at RTC. Um, I'll start that by reminding you that the uh, 
the commission and the county has partnered together um, on a planning study uh, called the Climate Adaptation and Vulnerability Assessment. As part of our public outreach program, RTC is conducting a survey where respondents can provide feedback regarding climate hazards that have impacted their travel. Participants will have the opportunity to provide valuable input on how RTC and the county prioritize metrics for consideration of future projects to address the significant climate issues impacting county roads and the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Our planning lead on the study, Brianna Goodman, plans to highlight the results of the survey, which is open through November 10th. To take the, the survey, please go to the RTC website at secrtc.org. Right there on the homepage under news and updates, there's a link to the climate resiliency survey and the county and RTC value your input. So if you have interest in that, please um, uh, go online and complete the survey. Um, I have an announcement regarding the release of the draft EIR for the coastal rail trail segments 10 and 11 and a draft uh, and a public meeting on the draft EIR that's uh, forthcoming. Uh, the draft uh, EIR for the coastal rail trail segments 10 and 11 has been released for public review and comment. This critical four and a half miles line long segment traverses through a good portion of our county from 17th Avenue and Live Oak all the way to State Park Drive and Aptos. The draft EIR provides an evaluation of the potential environmental impacts of the proposed project and recommends mitigation measures to reduce impacts to less than significant where possible. To find out more about the EIR and where to view it, download it, or make comments, please go to the again to the RTC website. Um, there, again, under news and updates, you'll find a, a link that will provide you with all the information you need for the meetings and making comments on the draft EIR. A particular note, the County of Santa Cruz as lead agency is holding a public meeting on November 16th at 5 o'clock to receive public comment on that draft EIR. Um, that meeting location is still being finalized and will be posted on RTC's website no later than Monday of next week. Although we would love to see you in perfect person, if you uh, cannot make the meeting, again, please provide written comments um, uh, through December 15th of this year. Um, I have another uh, meeting announcement uh, regarding uh, aesthetic features on the Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane and Bus and Shoulder Project from State Park uh, uh, Drive uh, to Freedom Drive, uh, which includes Segment 12 of the Rail Trail. Um, RTC will be hosting a public meeting December 5th uh, to get community input on potential aesthetic features such as lighting, signage, public art, and bridge railing options for the project. On the highway side, the project replaces two existing railroad bridges between State Park Drive and Rio de Mar interchanges and widens the Aptos Creek Bridge. Um, it also replaces the <laughs> rail bridges over the highway. On the trail side, the project extends uh, uh, the coastal rail trail from uh, State Park Drive to Rio del Mar Boulevard and includes five major bridges and traverses through the heart of Aptos Village. The public meeting is on December 5th at six o'clock at Rio Sands Hotel in Aptos. Um, more, there's more information posted um, on RTC's website. Um, I have an announcement that on October 18th, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District uh, awarded a grant of $194,900, just short of $200,000 to RTC for the Go Santa Cruz County Bicycle Incentives Program. You may remember we talked about that extensively at prior meetings. Uh, we applied for that funding and was awarded it. Uh, this program will provide income qualified applicants with vouchers for standard bicycles, electric bicycles, and discounted annual memberships to the B-Cycle Bike Share Program. The RTC was one of 11 projects awarded a total of $1.3 million in grant funds out of three, over $3 million of requested funding. Uh, the RTC is uh, also a seek, seeking additional funding for this program from the consolidated call for projects, which will be on next month's agenda. Um, now I think it's time for me to close my laptop and Thank you for all of the wonderful comments that I just heard and to um, acknowledge what this commission really means and what it means to me and what it means to the public and what it means to the community at large. Transportation is 
one of these really unique issues that really affects all of us. It provides us with our ability to get around. It provides us with freedom. If anybody knows what it's like to not be able to get from point A to point B, you will realize how important it is that we include everybody, consider everybody's feelings, thoughts, and priorities because we have the ability to make a difference. The ability to make change and be positive about how we address things um, that affect everybody's life starts here with this commission on transportation on the regional level. And it ends here with this commission. It starts with this commission in that you provide good thoughts and good direction on where you want us to be going. We do the planning necessary to put us in position to build partnerships and to bring home improvements that are going to make a difference in people's lives. Um, I wanna thank the commission, especially my chairs, and I've had six of them um, in the five years that I've been here. I started with John Leopold, who um, headed the search for my position. Um, he was so generous when he offered me the position and thanking me for my interest in coming here. And I was just floored. I mean, I was like, are you kidding me? I wanted this job so bad. And for him to be thanking me for being interested in the position, he really cared about this community and wanted to make sure that he found the right person to, to move this, this, um, this agency forward. Um, I heard from some of my chairs here today, but they're not all here today. Some of them have retired and moved on. My second chair was Ed Bodorf um, uh, with the city of Capitola. Um, Ed instilled a level of confidence in me that I cannot thank him for more. He trusted me. He gave me the, um, the strength that I needed to get through some of the very difficult issues that um, I was about to, to be faced with. Um, I, I remember um, talking to many different people about um, this job, and I, I just remember stating that I didn't realize how political it was going, going to be. Um, you know, I, I went to UC Berkeley. I thought that um, I've seen it all. No, um, I, Berkeley's got nothing on Santa Cruz. We we know how to keep people involved, and and it's 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 different. My next chair was was uh, Bruce McPherson, and um, what a statesman! I learned so much from uh, Commissioner um, Bruce McPherson about how to build relationships and how to bring people together, how to communicate and respect the feelings of different people. Um, the comments that I heard here today about my listening and talking and um, bridging the gap um, was so much driven by the relationship I had with Bruce McPherson. Um, Bruce was my commissioner when COVID hit, and um, that was extremely hard. Um, it was extremely hard for so many reasons um, uh, to try to be able to shift everything on a dime and be able to continue to succeed as an agency. Um, Bruce was right on it. Um, the hardest thing that we had to do was not to be able to meet in person anymore. Um, I will miss those days of, of the Huevos Vancheros down at uh, uh, El Palomar, uh, where we would go over the agenda and talk about the important issues that affected our county. Uh, uh, we shifted from, from uh, Commissioner McPherson to um, Commissioner Aurelio Gonzalez. And Aurelio was um, an amazing chair. Um, he got us through some of the most difficult meetings that we had um, with very little experience in government service. Um, he had a passion for giving back to his community that I've seen by no other commissioner. Um, he wanted to serve and do this position more than anyone that I knew of. And it was therefore very, very hard for him to have to step down in the middle of his tenure. And he did so for personal reasons. And that is something that I can relate to and I can appreciate. 
And um, I hope people understand when people make decisions that there are sometimes reasons behind them that are hard for us to understand. And he taught me that it is very, very important to consider your own personal needs um, sometimes um, for the best of everybody involved. Um, from there, Sandy Brown took over. And um, Sandy um, was just a sponge. She wanted to learn. She wanted to understand. She asked great questions. She was extremely patient in me because I can be extremely long-winded, extremely detail-oriented, and want to get all the facts out there. But what Sandy taught me more than any other commissioner was to listen to the public and to really engage and make sure that we represent the people that um, are part of our community. Um, like no one other, uh, Sandy Brown uh, cares about what the community feels and cares about how we consider their thoughts and opinions about everything we do. And now Chair Koenig. Um, uh, Chair Koenig, uh, is my last chair and, and the one I had to speak to about stepping down. And um, we built a close personal relationship. But uh, uh, Chair Koenig is um, an amazing, um, intelligent man who really wants to understand the facts and drive them home. He cares about this community like you won't. You, you, don't, you don't understand how much he cares about the issues and making sure that he represents his entire community. Um, when we came out of COVID and we got to go back to in-person meetings, I got to go on my very first in-person post-COVID um, legislative meeting up in Sacramento with uh, Chair Koenig. And you should see him step to the plate and represent this community on all of the issues um, that we care about. And he... Uh, represented this community and helped bring home a lot of the grants that we recently seen because he spoke about them in a way that came from his heart. And he really does care about um, making sure that we address the issues that are most important to everybody in this community. Um, these partnerships that I developed with each of the chairs and a lot of the other commissioners that I don't have enough time to mention all of you here, so I decided to focus just on the chairs, um, is very important in kind of driving home the approach and the style that's needed to be a successful organization. Um, it's all about partnerships. And when you're a small agency like the RTC with limited resources, it's very important that we build consensus and community building efforts to make sure that we can do as much with um, very little resources. I want to thank my partner agencies, uh, Santa Cruz Metro. Um, the relationship has never been stronger. Um, I've learned that we must work with the transit agency to build a partnership to really deliver and bring home the projects that are uh, necessary to keep people moving on our bus system and to advance uh, additional improvements that are going to um, really improve the quality of life of all of the citizens. The county and the cities have worked with us on delivering the rail trail projects. We can't deliver all of the projects on our own. We've developed partnerships, we've worked together, we've uh, strategized on how to address the, the various values that are important to our community and the way we develop the projects. That all comes from statewide and federal relationships, which we go up to Sacramento. We meet with the CTC. We meet with the California State Transportation Agency and with Caltrans to make sure that we understand the direction that government is going and what we need to do to make sure that we can bring home what's needed to this community and what's deserved by this community. It's interesting, um, at the conference that we recently went to, I was on stage um, sitting with some of my colleagues. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Brown was in the audience and, and um, there was a lot of talk about uh, the goals of uh, the state and the federal government and, and, and what's being done to meet them. And, and one of my colleagues talked about um, having, you know, come around that they, you know, 
that she's drinking the Kool-Aid now and, and, and understanding where to go. That was so easy for me to follow up with. Um, and, and I did so by um, letting the rest of those in the room and the state know that um, you may now be drinking the Kool-Aid, but Santa Cruz, we made the Kool-Aid. <laughs> we really did. I mean, we did so with the very, very good planning that had been taking place well before I came into this role. Um, this staff here at RTC and this commission with the decisions that you made put us in position to have the successes that we have had. And you've done so by having very good collaborative discussions. You may not have always agreed on certain items, but you've respected each other and you listened to each other and you listened to staff and you've made decisions and you've continued to ask for more information. And we've tried to present it to you in an unbiased fashion and in a way that you can learn and we can learn from each other and continue to maintain flexibility because guess what? Cherry may have been the flavor yesterday, but it's probably going to be great next week. And be prepared to change the formula, be flexible, and do what's necessary by listening to your community and bringing home the transportation improvements that will continue to allow people to improve their quality of life and the freedom that transportation brings them. I thank you for the trust that you've had in me and your staff. This has been a wonderful experience. And that concludes my director's report. Thank you so much, Director Preston. Is there any public comment on the director's report? Okay. Right. Krista Corwin of your staff. Guy, I know you don't like to be the center of attention, but I just wanted to say I'm really going to miss you. It was great working under you. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Corwin. All right. Seeing no other public comment. Thank you very much, Director Preston. And now we'll proceed with the Caltrans report. Director Eads, I know it's a hard act to follow, but <laughs> as long as you don't announce your retirement, I think you'll you'll do fine. <laughs> Got you. And you are on mute there. Sorry, I said that is an art, hard act to follow. Um, good morning, um, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, Scott E, District 5 Director. So uh, I just have a few things for you this morning. First, just want to assure you that Caltrans is working to prepare for the winter and the storms that um, may come this, this year. Um, we've been we have been uh, ha holding meetings throughout the district where staff review protocols, consider opportunities for coordinating responses, ensure our equipment is ready, and also consider lessons learned from last year. So it's a whole host of staff, um, including our emergency response leaders, maintenance supervisors, construction engineers, um, geo tech folks, and others that are all involved in these efforts. So I um, just want to let you know we're already thinking about that. <laughs> and then there's a statewide number, but pretty significant in terms of roadside litter removal. The efforts are continuing as well there. Since launching Clean California, which a big focus of that effort was on litter removal in, in July of 2021, Caltrans and local partners have removed an estimated 1.86 million cubic yards of litter from state highways. That's a trash pile that would be more than 370 times taller than Mount Whitney at 14,000 feet. Well, that's what Mount Whitney is. Um, so pretty astounding in terms of all the trash that we've picked up. And just as a reminder to everyone, we don't put that trash there. Um, it generally comes from member of the, members of the public that just decide to throw stuff out or having you know not tarped loads on their trucks or whatever it might be. So please, please, everyone, um, you know, do what you can to try to eliminate trash that comes out of your vehicle um, to help us keep our roadsides clean. A couple things I want to highlight um, as well that are big feats at the statewide level. Um, California is the first inner city zero emission hydrogen passenger train in North America that will, will be coming soon to California. We signed a historic Caltrans signed an historic $80 million contract with Statler Rail earlier in October or mid-October 
to deliver the first zero emission hydrogen intercity, intercity passenger rail. Um, it'll be um, expected to operate between Merced and Sacramento. And uh, it's a big, it's the first of um, 25 additional train sets that'll be coming to California. And then also California was selected as a national hydrogen hub. So we'll receive 1.2 billion from the US Department of Energy to accelerate um, the deployment of clean renewable hydrogen. And uh, projects will include power, um, powered public transportation, heavy duty trucks, port operations and more. So both of those are um, pretty big feats at the larger level within California of what we're doing to forward hydrogen as an energy source for transportation. And then lastly, I just want to um, again say that um, tying on to others in the last item by Guy, it's been a, a great pleasure working with Guy over the last few years. His mix of experience and calm confidence presence has really benefited the RTC. Um, in our world, in the transportation world, there's many technical realities of how transportation projects are planned and programmed and delivered and um, Guy's mix of experience having that project delivery background and his willingness and ability to partner well with the transportation agencies and entities that need to be and resource agencies and others that um, need to be part of ultimately getting through an approval process and delivering these projects has been terrific. And so it's been an honor for us to work with Guy. We really appreciate your earnest partnership and I wish you the very best in your next endeavors. So thank you, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Director Eads. Any comments or questions from commissioners? Seeing none, any comments by members of the public? Thanks. Isn't, there's no one online. Okay. Thank you very much, Director Eads. Chair Koenig, if I if I could uh, step in just for one, um, I realized that the commission was doing kind of a voice vote mm -hmm. on the items. And since we're under an AB 2449 meeting, that's technically a teleconference meeting. Uh, and so I would ask the commission to just for the record, have the have Yusania read the role for both the consent calendar first and then secondly for the resolution for Mr. Preston. So we can record that as a roll call vote. And I apologize for not catching that earlier. Thank you for the clarification. All right, we will, uh, Clerk, if you could call a voice vote first for the consent agenda. I think she could do them both, maybe as one vote. Commissioner uh, Hernandez. Aye. Mr. Eats. Sandy, uh, sorry, Mr. Eats. Commissioner uh, Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Montesino. Yes. Commissioner um, Alternate Shiprin. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Yes. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Pegler. Aye. Commissioner Watkin. Aye. That's unanimous. Hey, wait. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. <laughs> Who? Oh. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Good everyone. That. that passes unanimously. All right, and now um, a vote on the resolution for our retiring executive director. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Montesino. Yes. Commissioner Hernandez. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Pegler? And Commissioner Watkin? Aye. That also passes unanimously. All right, thank you. We'll now proceed with item 23, which is the public hearing on the Measure D five year program of projects for regional projects and lift line and strategic implementation plan update. And for a presentation on this item, we have. Tommy Travers, our transportation planner. Thank you, Chair Koenig. Um, good morning, commissioners. My name is Tommy Travers. I'm staff um, at RTC. This morning, um, staff is going to be requesting that you uh, consider and adopt the five-year plans for uh, Measure D funds for the next five years as well as consider and adopt the update to the strategic implementation plan. 
So I'll try to advance the slides myself here. Uh, so here's some uh, Measure D background information that we try to provide every year. <clears throat> so recognizing significant transportation challenges, but not enough money to address needs, a decade was spent working with the community to craft a transportation package that would likely be approved by the state required two thirds majority of voters. A board coalition, including RTC board members, business leaders, realtors, medical organizations, community groups, environmental groups, neighborhood groups and students worked together on the project list. Um, the measure passed in November 2016, and we're still sort of in the earlier years of those 30 years um, of Measure D. Oops. Uh, yeah, it's jumping around here. So no, Okay. Um, so the voter approved expenditure plan allocates a half cent measure D sales tax revenues by formula to five categories of projects, uh, the neighborhood streets and roads category, transit and paratransit serving um, elderly and those with disabilities in the community, highways, rail and active transportation category. Next slide. Measure D revenues have been stronger than anticipated back in 2016. Revenues has ranged from 21 to over $27 million per year. Next slide, please. RTC works with consultants to estimate revenues for planning purposes. They have estimated moderate growth of about 2 to 3% per year over the next five years. Next slide. The Measure D expenditure plan describes general types of projects and programs eligible for funding over 30 years. The ordinance requires recipients to annually adopt five-year programs of projects, also known as the five-year plans, showing how they propose to use revenues in the near term. The RTC is responsible for programming funds for regional categories and projects. The five-year plans for the regional categories provide RTC committees and the public with the opportunity to provide input on specific use of their tax dollars. The 2023 five-year plans cover this fiscal year through 2027-28. The RTC also provides the public forum for and adopts the LiftLine five-year plan for its share of the funds since Community Bridges is not a public agency. Next slide. In each of the five-year plans, Measure D funds are being used to serve as match to leverage a variety of state, federal, and local funds and grants in order to make our tax dollars go much further than they otherwise would. RTC staff presented the five-year plans and the strategic implementation plan update, um, or the highlights of that strategic implementation plan update to the ITAC, um, the bike committee, and the E&D TAC over the last month for their input, and they did not recommend any changes. Next slide, please. In addition to the five-year plans, the Measure D ordinance requires the RTC as the taxing authority to prepare a longer-term implementation plan to be updated no less than every five years. The, um, so that long-term implementation plan, the Strategic Implementation Plan, or SIP, considers programming needs, describes potential financing tools, and models possible new revenue and debt service. And I'll come back uh, a little later to the SIP um, in this presentation. Next slide. And then next slide. Uh, so our new five-year plan carries forward previously committed funds for construction of over 17 miles of the rail trail from Davenport to Aptos and in Watsonville. Segments five and eight through 11 have secured grants to fully fund construction. The RTC received a presentation on trail maintenance and capital costs to complete the Coastal Rail Trail earlier this fall. And fund amounts were adjusted based on the latest cost estimates available, scheduled for trail openings, and the assumed percentage of ongoing trail maintenance that Measure D will have to cover. There are ongoing funds for rail trail corridor maintenance and property encroachments, including vegetation and drainage maintenance, trash and graffiti removal, environmental permitting, and boundary surveys. 
The current approach is to initiate pre-construction work on segments 13 through 20 from Aptos to Pajaro as part of the zero emission passenger rail and trail projects concept report, which is the first part of the environmental analysis. This funding will also serve as the local match to leverage state and federal grants. The rail and trail project analysis is funded by both the trail category and the rail category. The RTC continues to regularly meet with and coordinate um, with implementing jurisdictions in this county and with regulatory bodies. Next slide. And you can see here uh, that almost all segments are in some phase of development. Next slide. So I'll just touch on a couple of these. Um, segment five will begin construction next year. And the draft EIR, I think Guy mentioned that uh, for segment 1011 is currently accepting public comments right now. We have additional new project fact sheets for each of the trail segment projects. Um, they're not in the full agenda packet today, but they are included in chapter six of the strategic implementation plan, which is posted online and linked in the packet. Next slide. Uh, the highway category will continue implementation of previously approved projects and leverage funds. There is the auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder facilities from SoCal Avenue to Freedom Boulevard uh, and the, four, the new bike ped uh, bridges over the highway um, for them, which uh, includes two rail trail bridges in Aptos. We also continue funding for other traveler assistance and safety programs, the FSP roving tow trucks on highways one and 17, the extra CHP enforcement on highway 17, um, and the Cruise 511 program, including Go Santa Cruz County, which provides financial incentives for using alternative transportation and makes it easier to find carpools and bike pools. Next slide. And here's just the location of the highway category projects um, in our county. Um, and then the next slide will show more detail um, of the Highway 1 project specifically. Next slide. The five-year plan's focus is on accelerating delivery and leveraging funds, getting people moving along our most congested corridor in our county. The environmental phase for the State Park to Freedom segment will be completed by the end of this year, 2023. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, so the five-year plan provides funding to maintain and repair railroad infrastructure, including ongoing repairs, and funds to initiate the environmental analysis and preliminary engineering for the zero emission passenger rail and trail project, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. The RTC continues to seek grant funding to fully fund the highway, the rail trail, and transit projects that were all recommended in the Unified Corridor Investment Study along our three main coastal routes. The combination of projects, uh, sorry, the combination of um, various improvement projects into grant applications makes both our trail and our highway projects more competitive. The RTC and our local jurisdiction partners have been very successful in the last three years in securing grants, as you know, and the five-year plan anticipates continued future success in additional grants. Next slide, please. Measure D is also, uh, also designates funds from the neighborhood category uh, for the San Lorenzo Valley Highway 9 corridor and for the Highway 17 wildlife crossing. This just shows the locations of the, um, the current planning and design efforts. Next slide, please. The plan continues to program, I'm sorry, the, the five-year plan continues to program funds as seed money to secure outside grants to fully fund the top priorities that were identified in the SLV Complete Streets Corridor Plan. The SLV Schools Complex Access and Circulation Study was completed this year. And we're currently seeking grants for Boulder Creek sidewalk, sidewalk projects. Next slide, please. The wildlife crossing has been completed now and is successfully providing safe passage for uh, wildlife and reducing collisions. Next slide, please. Each year, um, there's a growing number of older people 
in our county that needs specialized transportation services. Approximately a third of our county's population does not drive due to age, income, or ability. Today, we're also considering the five-year plan for using the 4% of the Measure D funds that go for lift line paratransit. Next slide, please. Measure D has allowed LiftLine to add weekend and evening service. The new five-year plan includes continued funding for expanded services, using Measure D to leverage grants for new vehicles, and the LiftLine operations facility in Watsonville, and it adds an, another um, half full-time equivalent driver starting in fiscal year 24-25, and funds for vehicle operations. These services are a lifeline to disadvantaged populations. Next slide, please. So as described in the staff report, um, staff is seeking input and approval for the 2023 update to the strategic implementation plan. Um, keep that slide. So the RTC got assistance from consultant k &N Public Finance to assess the financial status of Measure D and update financing options. The RTC board has had recent discussions about borrowing and took action in support of continuing to plan for such actions when the time comes. The new update to the strategic implementation plan models likely borrowing in the form of bonds and estimates the, uh, the first, and it, and it estimates that the first two, the first of two bond offerings will be in um, probably 2025. Before that might happen, staff will return to the board. The current estimate is to bond for around $119 million, and that includes the debt payments. Next slide, please. Uh, the financing options have already been presented to the RTC and discussed. The SIP has been updated to provide the latest information on the options, um, but I won't go into further detail on these, this information. Next slide, please. A current snapshot of our cash flow model is included in Chapter 5 of the SIP. The model incorporates staff's latest project cost estimates and expenditure timing. It helps to illustrate that a pay-as-you-go approach will not be able to fund projects in the expected timelines, which we propose in order to take advantage of grant programs, to try to minimize rising construction costs, and to deliver projects as soon as possible to the community. Um, so as far as the not yet in the model, bullet points on the lower half of this slide. So since these particular costs since these particular future costs either can't be estimated yet or are highly dependent on future RTC programming decisions, we do not include them in the model. We do need to consider that since the adoption of the 2020 SIP, the RTC has entered into several trail maintenance agreements committing additional Measure D trail funds. Next slide, please. The model provides the anticipated capacity of the project categories. So we can work with those totals as the RTC continues to plan and make important decisions in the coming years. Because of the fact that not all long-term costs were able to be fully estimated in the trail and highway categories particularly, we highlight in the SIP the modeled capacity for those categories. For Highway 1, uh, we expect to conduct a planning study for the community to prioritize what comes next. So just to reiterate this slide and the previous slide, uh, we're providing the remaining capacity estimates, and these amounts are what is available for those future big decisions on um, segments 13 through 20 getting built, trail maintenance getting done, and possible next steps on Highway 1. Next slide, please. So next on deck, uh, we will continue with our ambitious programming to deliver projects on an accelerated timetable. Uh, we will also have audits of expenditures from the last fiscal year, 2022-23. The five-year, no, sorry, the five-member taxpayer oversight committee annually reviews the audits of expenditures to safeguard taxpayer revenues and prepares annual reports to the community to the um, to the public outlining the accomplishments of Measure D. Ongoing information about Measure D 
is available to the public online. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is what we're doing this morning. Um, written public comments have been shared in the handout. Um, so this is basically the outline of what we've done. And then uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if that's completely up to date, but we can proceed um, with the public hearing. Um, this concludes my presentation. Um, staff, uh, multiple staff, in addition to myself, are available for any questions from the commission. Um, and then we can proceed with the actual public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Travers. We can with questions or comments from commissioners. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So um, it looks like we're traversing from pay as you go to borrowing. Can you think of a worse time to borrow money when interest rates now and probably in the future is um, are about as high as they've been in the last 25 years? So I'll answer that question. Um, we're not proposing to borrow today, um, but we are proposing to move our projects forward. Um, when I was working for the Sonoma County Transportation Authority, interest rates were similar to what they are today, and we borrowed. We also refinanced those um, when we had the opportunity to. Um, we're going to have to continue to monitor what uh, the interest rates are and where they're going so we can put ourselves in the best position. Um, there are other mechanisms out there that I think we may want to consider as a commission that are different than what we did at, in Sonoma. There's something called TIFIA loans, and there's also um, an infrastructure bank that's um, uh, um, uh, been established by the federal government that would allow us to be able to borrow at a more reasonable rate. Um, and so we would be considering all of those things at the appropriate time. It's really hard to predict the future. But you have to consider the fact that um, um, if you don't move these projects forward um, on the schedules they are on today, that the costs of those projects are also going to go up. Um, inflation is kind of somewhat related to where we are with interest rates. And if we wait longer, those projects are going to become more expensive. We also receive significant amount of funding from grants that we would have to give back if we don't move forward. And then there's the third component, and that is the actual um, benefits of the project that would be available to the public a lot sooner. So I know where you're coming from. I wish we were bonding back when interest rates were a lot lower, and I hope that they do come down prior to us needing to bond. But I think it would be more dangerous to not move forward than to, um, to, to take the issue that is in front of us today and the victories that we've had and the needs that we have for our community and realize that this is a good plan and it's what we need to do to be able to deliver the projects as soon as we possibly can. Okay, thank you for that. On another subject, um, so from the perspective, I, I, I think we are, when we sit up here, we're for the greater good for the whole county. Um, I do, however, have to look at um, District 5, and Bruce McPherson is part of this, in terms of when I see our citizens paying you know, their fair share of a half-cent sales tax, and then when I see the future plans, um, there's a lot going on on Highway 1, and I guess Highway 17 gets its fair share, but that's for a, a crossing for um, animals. Um, Where's the love for places like Scotts Valley when I see future funds uh, being allocated? Um, we're not getting crossings for our pedestrians. Um, our, you know, um, Mount Hermon Road is used by 35,000. It's the second busiest road in the whole county. Um, but I'm not seeing grants or anything along those lines coming for something that is used primarily from for, by San Lorenzo Valley residents. So um, again, I'm not trying to be um, you know, selfish or anything like that, but at the same time, you know, our citizens pay a lot more than they get. And one thing, and I, I certainly can't promise anything, but you know, we have identified, as I mentioned, that, that additional capacity that we anticipate for the highways category. And so you know, it could be possible 
that the community decides and the board, um, you know, amends the the Measure D expenditure plan in the next few years or so that that could include something on the Highway 17 corridor in, in Scotts Valley. So that's that's not something that's not that's not possible. Um, you know, we 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 have been accelerating the projects in you know from Santa Cruz to Aptos along Highway One, and so since those have actually been delivered sooner than anticipated originally, including adding the additional part from State Park to Freedom already um, that wasn't originally in the expenditure plan. That, you know, that's that's one part of the answer, at least, um, that we are, you know, we still have many years to go um, in the 30 year, 30 years of Measure D. And so there will be additional funds anticipated um, within the highway category. Um, Thank you. Big guy, if you have any other um, comments. Thank you for the questions, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner McPherson? Yeah, on the, the uh, issue of interest, and I appreciate the question, but and you pretty much answer, answered it. If we were to say, okay, we'll just back off and not put these uh, projects or plan for them and explain because we're concerned about the interest rates, does that diminish the uh, states? Do they say, hey, well, how badly do they want this? Uh, or... I mean, not to keep it in the plan would be a mistake, I think, uh, overall, no matter what the interest rate is. And I agree, it's not the greatest time to do it, uh, from uh, just cost-wise. But does the state, uh, if you if you back off on any of this, do they say, hey, well, wait a minute, maybe they, how serious are they? They've been great to us. So our projects require full funding plans to apply for grants. Um, the CTC and uh, will not award money to a partially funded project. Um, they also are looking for um, a, a match. Um, Measure D represents that match. So when we've applied for funding and we received funding, we made a commitment to that. If we can't come up with the money, we we basically can't sign the agreement with the state to receive their funding. We've effectively uh, leveraged funding at about a ratio of five to one. So when you start looking at, okay, I'm paying um, more in interest, considerably more in interest than I would have if we would have been able to bond earlier. And we can't bond earlier because you have to have a reasonable expectation of expending the fund within three years. You can't we couldn't have bonded back a, a year ago and and held on to the money now earning interest on it. That's not permitted. Um, but we we do need to keep our commitments to it, and we do need to consider continue to be able to make um, match commitments for future grants so that we can move forward with it. But when you consider you're getting five to one back on your investment, that interest rate hit. Yeah, it, it hurts, but it's um, it's well worth it um, considering the fact that you've you've actually brought in five dollars for every one dollar that you're spending. Okay, and secondly, I um, agree with uh, Mr. Johnson about addressing some uh, Scotts Valley area uh, issues that uh, you know how much are they getting back and so forth. But on the other hand, I want to just say uh, I can't uh, say how much I appreciate. Uh, the bonding or the uh, grant success that we've had and the cooperative effort we've had from Caltrans um, up in Highway 9, which when you have a state highway as your main street through a, a, a highly populated rural valley, uh, it's difficult to keep up. And uh, I really appreciate the efforts that have been for the wildlife crossing and the, the uh, school district to the downtown Felton. Uh, that's going to become a reality or has become uh, the wildlife crossing is a reality. The first one in the state, as I recall. And uh, so and I think that uh, I see Mr. Helmer here that's going to come up with some concerns, too, about what we have and some it's more speed signs and so forth. But uh, I just uh, think. Uh, for targeting some of the uh, really big projects that we are very much needed in uh, the San Rosa Valley, uh, downtown Felton. And then we've had the awful slides and so forth. Uh, I can't say enough about Caltrans and our County Public Works Department of how they've responded as quickly as they can. And that's been very frustrating for the drivers of the community up there, but uh, they've done a tremendous job in getting to the projects uh, when they're or the disasters when they need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Quinn. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. I really appreciate how approachable and how comprehensible this package was. But I'm curious about what feels to me like something out of sync. Uh, I believe the decision on interim versus ultimate trails coming here in March. And yet when I look at the planning, especially the bridges in Aptos and the buttressing on the trail in Capitola, it looks as if we're presupposing we're going with the ultimate trail and investing a lot in spending in a manner that we have not yet determined is the path forward. Is that a question or? It's a question. And so how do we reconcile the fact that we're spending money we don't have on a plan that we have not yet finalized? So in May of 2022, uh, we came to the commission with the concerns of the interim versus the ultimate trail in that we had a historic round of active transportation program funding available by the state and needed to make a decision about what to apply for in order to see where where we were going to uh, to go with those grant applications. Um, this was one of the uh, the the more difficult meetings. I remember staying up all night before the meeting and changing my recommendation um, from what was written in the package to what I presented on that day. Um, um, the commission was split and was not sure where to go with the interim versus the ultimate trail. And my revised recommendation, I recommended that we ask for the higher amount and then we decide where we want to go um, from there. Um, the commission accepted that recommendation and we voted on asking for the larger amounts for the ultimate trail. The California Transportation Commission received those applications and awarded us the funding needed to um, construct the ultimate ba trail based on the um, the uh, cost estimates that we had at that time. Uh, we continue to move forward with those projects uh, based on that recommendation. However, you are correct, Commissioner Quinn, in that um, there were two other things that I mentioned at that meeting with regards to the recommendation that was very important. One was the outcome of the vote on Measure D 2022 um, and, and where that um, was going to lead us. And the other was the environmental documents themselves. Um, the environmental documents um, have very important information about um, the environmental impacts and the mitigation measures. Um, those environmental impact reports are coming out and uh, actions are being taken on them. But with the funding in place for the ultimate trail, the, um, the, the agencies have been moving forward with the direction um, uh, that we received from the commission and the funding that we have to build it. Um, now, there are going to be additional um, uh, decisions that the commission can make with regards to these projects as they move forward. Um, the RTC is the owner of the rail corridor and um, in such, we have to enter into agreements with the local agencies on what we're going to actually build for these projects. So um, I was hoping to have brought the uh, segment eight and nine cooperative agreement um, prior to uh, me departing, but the county and the city are still working through some issues on the language that they want to see in there. But um, uh, they uh, they are moving forward with a project to build what is referred to as the ultimate trail or the rail, the trail adjacent to the existing rail line. And that will likely come in front of you uh, into the future. This here in front of you today is a plan and it's a funding plan um, that could be changed if the commission so decides to change their mind with respect to, to this, but I don't necessarily know that that's going to happen, but you are the decision-making body and you will have various opportunities to pivot if you want to. Um, I've um, tried to um, coach and work with and collaborate with the county and the city and staff to maintain flexibility because you never know exactly what is going to happen. And so these projects have been developed in such a way, but this financial plan um, needed to consider the actions that have previously been taken by the commission. And that was a vote to fully fund the ultimate trail. And that's what we modeled. We could model, you know, what it would be if it would be the interim trail, but then I would be producing two plans to move forward with. 
Um, this strategic implementation plan has a series of policies associated with them. Um, as mentioned by uh, planner Tommy Travers, um, this plan is updated at least every five years, but there's also a policy in there that allows um, amendments to the plan at any time. So if ever this commission is interested in making a change, you have the option of doing so and you have the flexibility in doing so, but it takes a majority of the commissioners to vote on doing so for that to happen. So we present this plan to you today based on the assumptions that we have made based on decisions that have previously been made by the commission. If those are to change, we will pivot and we will change and act accordingly. If I can continue, I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. And I also recognize this is a prickly issue, but I'll stick on it a minute longer. I, I do believe as a commission, we also said that should new data come to light, we would consider that data and review our options. And I would say to this commission that what we've learned over the last couple months is we don't have enough money to execute what we have. We'll be borrowing at an all time high. And we've told our community that we'll have a pretty darn good trail for the north half of the county. But the south half's gonna have to wait at least 15 years before we have the coffers and the funding to go after completing that trail. I don't think that's very fair to the people of Aptos and South. So I, I do think it's at least a time for reflection on whether the current plan is fair to the whole county. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. Commissioner McPherson? Yeah, I just wanted on the presentation, if I could suggest when uh, we identify for the public to have a better understanding, we put segments eight and nine or 10, and we say, where's the starting point and where's the ending point uh, and roads or crossings or whatever. I, I think, uh, the general public doesn't know what five is from eight or 12 or whatever. So I think it'd be really good if they're going to have a look at the, the plan that we're proposing that we, we put down. It's from this point to that point in streets and roads. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson, Commissioner Shepard, and then Commissioner Montesino. Yes, I have a couple of questions of staff. The funding that the commission has uh, gotten approved for segments eight and nine and 10 and 11 and even 12 as part of the highway widening project. Are they time bound? Uh, how long does the commission have to move forward with these projects? So all of these uh, funds that we received from grant awards uh, were, they, they do have time restrictions on them. Uh, they're generally, um, you know, eight and nine, I think is scheduled to go to construction in a couple of years. 10 and 11 is scheduled to go to construction about a year after that. Um, it, you know, you can sometimes get extensions on them, but um, right now our designers are moving forward with designing one trail and that's the trail adjacent to the rail line. Um, okay, so that's, they are time bound. They are time bound. Uh, yes. And the, you know, to spend this almost $100 million, um, the commission has to move forward with these rail trail projects. Can the interim trail be built without the abandonment of the uh, um, great easement? No. So is there any way, even if the commission decided to ignore the 74% uh, vote in favor of maintaining the rail, if the commission voted to eliminate the, tra uh, the rail line uh, through an uh, <clears throat> adverse abandonment, could it be done in a way that would meet the timeline of, of using the the funding that's available? Possibly. Really? You think you could get through with an adverse abandonment at the Surface Transportation Board within two or three years? Yes. Okay. Um, so what you're saying is, should the commission decide to avoid or ignore the vote of the people on Measure D, um, they could do that. Maybe we should, I mean, if there are members of the commission who would rather have no trail or at least push forward with an interim trail, I would suggest that they put a motion on the floor to initiate adverse abandonment and see if the commission really wants to do that to the public. Because we keep hearing meeting after meeting that we should go forward with the interim trail. The interim trail requires requires the commission to initiate adverse abandonment. It would, we, I received over a thousand emails um, 
opposing that. We had a 74% vote opposing uh, eliminating the trail. If the commission wants to avoid uh, avoid that, ignore that, let somebody, Mr. You know, one of the one of the commissioners, put the item on the agenda and let's vote on it, because it's just ridiculous to have this same conversation each meeting where people say, "Let's have the interim trail. Let's get rid of the." Uh, ultimate trail. And you're saying it can be done. Well, if a majority of the commission wants to do it, let's vote on it uh, and see whether whether they do or not. Because otherwise, what we're faced with is this continual dis uh, undermining of moving forward with almost $100 million in projects with a project that the the people don't seem to want in terms of the voters. And this commission hasn't, as a majority, supported. If that's changed, then I think the commission has an obligation to the public to do it and um, see where it goes. If you're right, and I don't think you are, that it can get through the surface transportation board with the kind of opposition that's out there in two years, so be it. Let the commission make that decision and, and move forward. Thank you, Commissioner Schiffrin. Commissioner Montesino? Yeah, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to go around talking about the rail and trail and because there's a funding mechanism. This is investment in our community, $100 million. We need to move forward on, uh, on this effort. We need to be aggressive. I know that uh, I, I know there's um, inflation and interest rates, but it just gets more expensive. We need to move forward and invest in our community. You know, we I can uh, all say I didn't get this. I didn't get that. Uh, you know, but we need to put this funding mechanism and we need to work as, as a, a, a as a commission to um uh, you know get more get more funding for all those projects and, and highways of anything discussed by because yeah there are concerns over there you know you know all those bridges and all those overpasses you know um uh, we need a lot of investment i also have a highway going on main street we need a lot of investment there and all these concerns but like i said right now this is what we have and this is what we need to move forward on. Um, all the other discussions are great, but we can bring them back, you know, um, uh, you know, as uh, some people have uh, stated. So just thank you. And hopefully we can go out and get community input. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Montesino. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if the if we did decide to go with an interim trail, are the grants that we received eligible for that? Or were the grants only for the ultimate trail design with rail and trail? Um, we would have we would have to have a conversation with the CTC. Um, it would not be uh, a slam dunk. Um, I was very specific to all of the agencies um, based on the direction that I received from this commission at the May 2022 meeting to be silent about the rail, the existence of rail and the rail line, that we were essentially applying for a trail. The project um, that we put forward and the benefits that we put forward were for a trail, not for the rail line. The rail line is not funded. As I mentioned earlier, the CTC only um, considers funding for individual projects. And when they look at the parameters and why they grant funds to particular projects, they look at the benefits of the two projects. The benefits of an interim trail versus the benefits of an ultimate trail are essentially the same. Um, there's some differences, but I'm not going to get split hairs about it. Um, but there's a lot of people who feel as if the rail should be considered as part of their analysis, but it was not um, because the rail is not funded. So it would have to be a conversation with them um, because it is a little bit different than the way I believe some of the local agencies presented things to the, to the CTC, but I wouldn't say it was, would necessarily be impossible. And that's very consistent with the message that I gave the commission in May 2022 when I changed my recommendation and said, let's ask for the money, that we would be able to maintain that flexibility. And if this commission so wanted to, that we could go back and ask the question. I have not asked the question because I have not received direction to do so. And Commissioner Schifrin is correct in that if this 
body wants to change direction, that somebody needs to make a motion and they would need to be willing to make the hard decision to force abandonment on the rail line and then take action to rail bank. And whether it could get done in that time frame or not, well, it would be tight, but we've had a lot of conversations on rail banking with our um, attorneys um, uh, that focus on S. S um, surface transportation board issues. And um, I continued to watch what was happening in other areas. And the uh, abandonment issue is based on uh, freight rail service. And with no freight being on the rail line um, north of Watsonville, um, there is a good chance that the surface transportation board, even with opposition, would approve rail banking. And um, that's something that this commission could act on, but it is your decision. And um, I don't see right now that necessarily that's what's driving, you know, the discussion. And, and you know, this is the first that I've heard that there is any interest in changing the direction that we might be going. Commissioner Rockin. Without weighing in on the, the rail trail and the interim versus ultimate trail, I just think we have to keep in mind how complex the transportation picture is. When we think like, well, well, what's Watsonville getting out of the trail part that's going to, as uh, Robert pointed out, you know, is going to be sometime off in the future compared to what's happening in the north part of the county. I think that's accurate. But... The transit districts making plans that make a huge difference to the people of Watsonville in terms of much more rapid and extensive service. And we're a big funder. Well, we're a group through which funding passes and we have something to say about, we're not the funder per se, but because uh, this is not about Measure D, it's about other sources. Um, it's coming up in a meeting in the not too distant future. So it, none of this stuff is simple. It's, you know, and and so the trade-offs are often say, well, okay, if you're not going to get a train in the near future and the trail's not going to get built in the near future, how willing is the commission to spend money on making the bus system really function for people that now take an hour and 15 minutes to, I just wrote it, it takes, a, you know, everybody said it's 45 minutes, an hour. It was an hour and 15 minutes it took me to get there. Um, so... There's a lot of complexity in this, and just I hope we can find a way to work through this in a way that keeps us together functioning, thinking about the big picture. I think that's kind of a key issue for all of us, and um, I think it's fine this issue came up. I think mean, these things need to be aired in public and talked about and looked at the options, um, but I, I really want to keep in mind how complex this is and how the decisions you know, made about one thing really affects something that's made about another. And the whole bus thing is not being discussed at all here, but that's a big funding question that's coming up for us in, in the near future. Um, early next year, I guess, will be when that actually comes to us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. Commissioner Quinn. I could be accused of perseverating, but I, I, I want to address this again. And I think it's important. If, if we look at our responsibilities, the commission, we're charged with a billion dollar long term decision. And the fact that there's variables in the equation we've been reluctant to address, I think underscores the confidence the public should have in us. If the rail banking issue is out there and we played dodgeball with it for how many years, why don't we call the question? I'm fully aware that 74% of the voters want rail included in all future plans. And the question is, does rail banking preclude that? Or does it in fact, is it a non-issue? And we played dodgeball with this for the whole time I've been on the commission. So, you know, as a point of order, if the question is, should rail banking be explored by the commission to see if it's viable and precludes future rail planning, I think we should have called this question years ago. We've been playing dodgeball with it, and everyone has an opinion, but we haven't rolled up our sleeves and really got the facts around it. And I think it behooves us as an organization on the verge of a billion-dollar decision to have all the facts on the table and have them in play. And I think it's unfair to put Commissioner Preston on a, could you, yes or no? We should know that. It doesn't bind us to any decision. But it's a factor we should know. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. I would uh, it, let me just say that it was on the table. It was voted on by the people. 
Um, the essentially the measure, the Greenway measure, didn't say there couldn't be rail ever. It just said it couldn't be in the plan. But what it meant to the people was we're taking out the tracks, and that's what they didn't support. And that's what rail banking does. People can have the illusion that the tracks can come back someday, um, but anybody who has been um, at least from my perspective, anybody who's been in the political world any amount of time will know that they'll never come back. Once a trail is there, there'll never be a rail again. Um, and I should also mention that if the commission decides to go with uh, towards an adver adverse abandonment, it also means that it's going to have to drop doing its rail study because it makes no sense to do a rail study if you're going to rip out the tracks, whether you do it for one year or 50 years or forever. Um, we're pursuing a rail study to try to find out where the rail is feasible, how feasible rail is now or in the foreseeable future. If, we, if the commission decides it wants to not have uh, the rail line uh, and to move forward with adverse abandonment, then it's essentially saying uh, the millions of dollars that we've, that we've gotten and are potentially needing to spend to go through a rail study uh, shouldn't be done. And again, I think that is not what the vote is voted on in terms of Measure D. And I think staff recognized that because it was right after Measure D uh, results were in that the staff initiated the rail study, uh, that would, the rail feasibility study that's going on now, uh, which had not moved forward before then because the commission was split and the um, the commission unanimously supported moving forward with the rail study after the vote. And I think what we're seeing here ha is how soon they forget and how those who have been opposed to rail from the beginning will use any opportunity to try to get the uh, tracks ripped up. So if I can respond a little bit to that, because there's some, por some important things to consider with respect to this. Um, I think you make a very good point in that if you remove the tracks, they may never come back. And I think that's the major concern. But there's an important clarification regarding rail banking that I would like to make. Um, rail banking does not require you to remove the tracks. Um, rail banking protects the right of way for future uh, reactivation of freight rail service. Um, See, so you may ask, well, then why would you want to rail bank? And we heard some public comment today about property rights and issues associated with the project development. And, um, uh, you know, it has to do with the very complex nature of um, uh, rail corridors and how the rail right of ways were obtained um, for rail purposes. Uh, a good portion of the rail line we own in fee but there are portions of the rail line that we only own an easement. Um, we are um, right now trying to um, deal with one of those issues where a property owner believes that um, they own the, uh, the, the, the underlining property and that we only have uh, an easement for rail purposes. There are other locations on some of these projects that I am aware of that are going to require us to obtain additional rights in order to build a trail adjacent to the rail line, even if we leave the rail line in there. But if we were to rail bank the line, we could choose to leave the rail in place, move forward with our concept report on the rail line and eventually build passenger rail. But we would not have to obtain additional property rights to build the trail because the land, land would be banked and protected for the potential reactivation and the uh, rail banking authority, which could be the RTC, can build a trail in any configuration on the rail line, whether it be removing the tracks and putting them in their place or adjacent to the rail line, just as we are planning to do. And that's why part of my May 2022 recommendation was that we continue to have the conversation on rail banking because rail banking would make it a lot easier to move forward with a trail on the rail line and even passenger rail on the rail line because we wouldn't have to deal with some of the issues associated with conflicting movements of freight rail and passenger rail at the same time. 
So I do think it's a good discussion that we're having here today about RAL banking. I wasn't expecting to have this discussion at our last meeting, but it is an important one and it could possibly be a factor in our ability to deliver some of these projects, even as currently envisioned and designed. If I may, the, I, you're absolutely right. And if the advocates for rail banking supported the ultimate trail, I would uh, be more inclined to agree with you. But the advocates for rail banking are the ones who want to rip up the tracks. Uh, they're the ones who want the interim trail. And I think we have to recognize that that's the political reality. Under a different scenario where we had real support for moving forward with a rail and a trail, um, it, it might really make sense to consider it, although there are implications for um, uh, Roaring Camp that I think have to take, be taken into consideration. But that's not the political reality we're in. The advocates for rail banking are the advocates for ripping up the tracks. And I think uh, call it an interim trail, call it trail only, call it whatever you want. It means ripping up the tracks. And uh, that's why I keep emphasizing that because I think that's what's the root of it. But on the other hand, that's not be really not before us today. We're dealing with a five-year plan. And um, I think that we should probably get on with that. <laughs> Please. Well, so I'll just comment, if I may. I wouldn't presuppose that advocates for rail banking even have a fixed position on the ultimate disposition. I don't. I want to see the data. My, my opinion on this has evolved significantly since I've joined the commission. And I think the decision on whether we need and can afford an ultimate train is why we've commissioned all these studies. I haven't prejudged anything. And I think that moving towards an ultimate train without the discipline of having investigated rail banking is somewhat reckless. I think we owe it to the public to investigate every tool in the box to get this done. And if rail banking is indeed a tool that facilitates an ultimate trail and train, we should be using it. We shouldn't have preconceptions that some tools are good or bad. We should fully understand their repercussions, how they can be used, and how they may backfire. And I, I will state on the public record, I do not have an opinion as to whether or not the ultimate trail or the train is the right. That's why I'm very invested in seeing what these studies show us. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. And I, uh, it's true that this commission makes decisions as a body. And so it's perfectly possible for the commission to move forward to vote, to proceed with rail banking because it's a legal process, which could save us a lot of liability and a lot of costs. And at the same time, in another vote, vote to proceed with the ultimate trail. That's perfectly possible, those two separate decisions. And so it's not that um, one yeah, necessitates the other. Um, of course, this question is not before us today. And I agree that I think there's a lot of information pending both in the passenger rail study uh, as well as in some of the final design work that's being done on trail segments now. Um, I mean, I think one feasible question that is related to and pertinent to um, the five-year plan today, um, is there any way that we could, looking at the rail corridor revenues, uh, is there any way that as we look at bonding, we could actually bond against some of the rail corridor revenues in order to uh, fix up the rail line to the extent that um, we can restore service, um, you know, for example, for Roaring Camp to get their locomotives all the way up to the boardwalk? In the same way that we're advancing money forward to do projects on the highway and um, the trail uh, categories, we could also do the same thing for um, the, the rail category. You just need to have a reasonable expectation to expend the funds within um, three years. You can't bond for construction without environmental clearance. So uh, you can bond for environmental clearance, but you can't bond for construction of a project that's not environmentally cleared. I hope that answers your question. A, a bit. Um, I'm curious sort of how much capacity there is if we could seek five to one matches for some of the rail money uh, in order to ultimately have enough funds to restore the freight rail line to you know, full functioning capacity anytime in the near future? So I would say we probably don't have enough capacity to restore the 
the rail line for freight rail uh, service. If we were to like focus only on that, I um, believe we estimated that about $60 million would be needed to restore the rail line for freight rail service. Um, the rail category has about 80 million over the full lifetime that's going to be collected and doing some math in my head and considering interest rates, I'd say we would probably run short of being able to uh, restore freight rail service on the line if we were to dedicate every last penny towards doing so and no longer fund any more passenger rail studies. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? Seeing none, then this is a public hearing and I'll open it to members of the public to comment on the five-year plan. Anyone here in chambers that wishes to address the commission? Yes, please push the podium. Welcome back. Thank you, Jim Helmer, Ben Lohman resident. Um, I presume me like you, we all live on local streets and we are not burdened with uh, significant traffic volumes and um, the noise and the congestion and the emissions in, that go along with, with uh, high traffic volumes. Speaking to Measure D and the Highway 9 corridor, Glen Arbor Road is a two mile long road that's classified as local, like your neighborhood streets and mine. It has served as the de facto state highway for over four months this year, 24 hours a day, rain or shine. For almost 10 years, the Bid Loman community has requested a two block stretch to have a walkway that's lit that keeps residents out of the rain, out of the ditches as they approach the downtown village. We've recently had our fire board president submit a letter to Supervisor McPherson and to you to fund a two block walkway on Glen Arbor Road, which by the way, is the de facto Highway 9 much of the time now. Also in Ben Lomond, it is one of three major or little communities on Highway 9. It's in the center. Felton is a terminus point. Boulder Creek is a terminus point. Ben Loman takes all of the through traffic with a, in a transitory manner. Um, the speeds are high. Pedestrian safety is a huge issue. And I just want to make sure that um, on the Highway 9 corridor, we applaud Felton and Boulder Creek improvements, but Ben Loman has not received any improvement money to date. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Helmer. Can I ask a question, staff. Commissioner Rockin. Without talking about the merits of what just was suggested, what's the mechanism by which, if somebody from the public thinks we should spend money on something that's not in the plan, what's the, how does that work? The mechanism. Well, in essence, there is money in the plan for just about everything. It's um, a lot of times it's um, our direct allocation programs, um, and those. Those funds go directly to the county and the cities and can be used on those purposes. So um, in the case of uh, Glen Arbor Road, which is not in our plan per se, um, the county could certainly use um, some of the neighborhood um, category funding, which is 30% of the sales tax measure for those types of projects. And um, I would recommend that um, uh, if interested, we discuss those issues with the County Public Works Department to see if that would be something that they were uh, willing to prioritize with their funding. Thanks. I didn't want to open that discussion now. I just wanted to get that question. Thank sure. you. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. The members of the public that wish to comment on the expenditure plan. Mr. Farrell, welcome. Thank you. Chair Conan again, commissioners. Uh, I'm speaking again, commenting on this five-year plan for Friends of the Rail and Trail. We're very excited about the elements of the trail, the segments that are including included in the five-year plan. It's a watershed year for the trail. The cities of Santa Cruz, the neighborhoods of Live Oak and the city of Capitola, 
and Aptos are all touched by segments of the trail that are under your consideration today. We encourage uh, the commission to support staff in applying for additional, we also support applying for additional grant funding to help staff move forward with preparing for the environmental review for the zero emission passenger rail project study. We uh, think that given the strong support for rail in Santa Cruz County, which you have all discussed for some length this morning, and the state's record of strong funding support for our county, we believe that Santa Cruz is a strong competitor in future implementation funds for future implementations funds. We also support continued maintenance on the branch line, and we're excited about the bonding discussions you're having this morning and the potential opportunities the director brought up about the state infrastructure bank. I think those are really good opportunities and worth supporting. And um, we also want to encourage the commission and staff to work with our federal and state legislators to do whatever we can to uh, secure and expedite the FEMA reimbursement. It's my understanding that's now about $1.6 million that the, that the RTC is due from uh, the federal government. So thank you very much. And uh, I really support moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Any other comments from members of the public here in chambers? Yes, please approach the podium. Morning. Morning. Well, I am certainly not a professional. I'm just a homeowner in Seacliff. And I thought this place would be packed and I would just be sitting here learning, but apparently not. So I guess I'll say something. Um, so all I know, you know, I'm no expert and I don't know the true difference between the ultimate. I'm assuming now the tracks stay and there's a trail next to it. Okay. Well, in our segment, which I think is 11, um, it's very narrow. And I think originally when I looked at the plans, you needed 45 feet, if I'm correct, to have a rail and a trail. And there isn't half that. So in my opinion, logically, I don't think there'll ever be a trail next to a rail in our segment, which is a long popular state park, Mar Vista right there. So um, I think that all that can happen is they're going to have to build all the way to the street. So I'm talking real impact for the people that live there. So am I correct to assume all the trees would be taken out? I see that they're all numbered. As I watch walk the dog, there's a plaque on every single tree and it's a beautiful corridor. So I'm talking, you know, the reality of a homeowner in an area. Am I to assume all those trees will be taken out and then replanted? So that's just horrifying. And there, there's a real riparian corridor going towards New Brighton, a little further from our house. And uh, so I don't have the answers to any of that. And I hope that you have a forester, a credible forester involved in the removal of trees. There's old oaks, um, eucalyptus, which probably nobody wants, but they're massive and beautiful. And then there's, it's a real dip and there's, um, uh, you know, soil built up to where the houses are and all these oak trees along the fence line, they're going to be taken out. And how's that going to affect the uh, soil erosion and whatnot? Thank you, sir. So thank you. Uh, and I would just call your attention to the fact that there will be a public hearing uh, or at least a public meeting on uh, the draft EIR for segments 10 and 11. I believe that was mentioned as December 5th. Uh, at Rio Sands. Actually, the location is not yet determined on oh. segment 10 and 11. The okay. Rio Sands is for uh, the highway project. Oh, sorry. Ch check our website after Monday on the location. And the date's no November 16th for the segment 10 and 11. Gotcha. Thank you for the clarification. Anyone else here in chambers that wishes to comment on the five year expenditure plan for Measure D? Seeing none, I see we have got a number of hands online. We'll begin with Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. 
Um, to answer the gentleman's question, yeah, all those trees are getting cut down with ultimate trail. They will not get cut down with interim trail. Um, we've submitted comments for the five-year plan. We're recommending the Capitola trestle be um, built as a as a trail because you're not going to have 60 trains flying on them ever. You'll have to tear that trail uh, trestle down. So we're hoping you add that. We also talk about the need to have the environmental report for segment 10 and 11 and maybe at 12 if that's the only option looking at ra the rail making and pulling the rails all the way from watsonville lee road uh, to santa cruz possibly to davenport so that can be an individual project if we have that as an individual project our community can make a, a gravel pathway and start using it. And Watsonville, can, we can get Watsonville connected. Now to address um, the idea of measure D vote, they voted to, to keep it as an option. And as we heard um, um, Guy Preston say, rail banking maintains that option for free, right? It maintains and it makes sure we protect that property. If we ever had a train in the future, you wouldn't be using those old railroad tracks. They have to come out no matter what. They have to come out. And we're penalizing our community not building the trail now. The, the finally, I'll comment that you haven't even gotten a response from the Coastal Commission. You're never going to, even if the tr people want a train, you can't have one. It goes within 20 feet of the coastline. You're never going to have a train going through Manresa. Southern California is spending millions of dollars relocating their train inland. So let's be realistic on our five-year plan, and let's open the coastal corridor now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Ms. Kittleson. Hi, I'm Judy Kittleson of Watsonville, and I am one of the 74% that voted to keep the tracks. And part of that was to not rail bank and to fund and implement rail service. So that was my understanding, and I, that's my hope. Um, my question to staff is that with the new data that came in that induced demand that the highway widening is ineffective, is there any way that we can move some of the funding from that toward the 8% to maintain and restore and repair the tracks um, with that new data, because you guys said that uh, now that you have, once you get new data, you can make changes. And the other thing I just want to put out there is the tracks are in place, the rail bed is there, and um, trail is very flexible and can be relocated, but having tracks and the train bed in place, uh, that's where I'd like to see the money put. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kittleson. Mr. Sain. Hey, thank you, Chair Coning. Um, really surprised that we're still talking about this, but just to give an example, um, the Measure D that lost last year gave us a voter mandate. Um, I went over 31 emails that you got on uh, item 23 uh, this morning. And some of the comments I'll give you just to show you where the uh, public is at is keep the rail uh, for passenger service from Watsonville to Davenport. Find a way to use tracks and trestle through Capitola Village. Widening freeway through Aptos, which requires destroying numerous redwoods, is short-sighted. Uh, how about a decentralized system of electric buses of different sizes so people can go where they live and also deliver them to where they need to go? Please think outside the box. Uh, June's 22-22 Measure D was defeated by 73% and should be considered a voter mandate to implement clean, quiet electric transit along the branch line. To compare that to the Ox Lane project, I, of course, for seven years have been advocating against the Ox Lane project for cars only. And all I heard for seven years was it's voter mandate. We're going to do it. And there's enough of the commissioners on that committee that's sitting up there that don't like the Ox Lane project, 
but they voted with the other commissioners out of respect and to get things moving along. Now we have a commissioner or two, I call them the Greenway commissioners, that can't get over their trail-only ideas. I think it's absurd. Um, to be fair, uh, there was opposition to funding the rail project, also Ox Lane project and highway widening, and there was support for an interim trail, but that's not on the table as I would think it should be. Uh, overall, I would say we're still a 50-50 split. And just keep in mind Measure D's defeat in June of 2022. And really quickly, I'd like to add that, as I mentioned earlier, we need to look at more techn technologically advanced transportation projects. Thank you. Please do, not, please do not limit us to 19th and 20th century transportation modes. Thank you. Mr. Vanessa. Okay, yes, uh, Ben Vernazza, Aptos. I sent you a three page presentation. I'm not going to go into detail. I just want to give you my opinion and others that right now the ultimate trail is not a class one trail and it's not safe. I want you to be realistic too about being able to do it. It's like someone with a 38 inch waist trying to fit into a 32-inch girdle. Now, the other advantage of the interim trail, you can split pedestrians and bikes with their own two lanes to and from. And also, you can do a trail from Watsonville to Cabrillo College because you're going to have the Mar Vista uh, over pedestrian overpass to get there. And once you get to Rio Del Mar Boulevard, if the freeway thing isn't settled, you just go down a state park drive and then go back up the hill and you're there. So it's very easy to get to. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vernazza. Mr. Bear Scott. Thank you, uh, Chair Koenig. Um, a couple of things to my uh, C cliff neighbor, uh, 30 feet is the minimal width for a corridor to include the, the tracks and the trail, not 45 feet. And the trees that are tagged are not all tagged for removal, but tagging is an identification process. Um, my, uh, on Measure D funding, and, and this was sent by a, a letter to uh, agreeing with uh, Matt Farrell, I hope we can uh, dedicate uh, greater funding toward the uh, zero emission rail transit business plan and uh, do everything we can to uh, fund repairs and seek FEMA reimbursement for the repairs to that rail line. Um, I was surprised, I'm surprised to hear this talk of the interim trail come back again. I thank uh, Commissioner Schifrin for laying out the, the facts and I, I wish Director Preston could have um, agreed with, with the points that were made instead of saying that we could conceivably rail bank. That is pretty weak language. Um, it seems very likely that we'd lose the funding, that we'd see nothing but delays, we'd uh, be scrapping the rail business plan project, and we'd be neglecting to adhere to last year's Measure D results, Unified Quarter Investment Study, TCAA, and so forth. One final point. Director Preston, you said $80 million is coming to the rail fund and $60 million is needed to be spent on the rail line. However, with the five to one match, isn't it true that we only need a $16 million local share to leverage the funds needed for the repairs we need? I thank you for your service and wish you well, Director Preston, and thank you, Commission. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Mr. Brian Largay. This is Brian Largay. Can you hear me? We can. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to comment on this topic. I live in Felton, and I'm concerned about the funding allocation for Highway 9 in the San Lorenzo Valley. I am so grateful for the concerted effort 
by Regional Transportation Commission and staff to advance plans for improving pedestrian safety along Highway 9. I'm hopeful that meaningful improvements will be built before any more young people are killed while walking home from the school campuses. My concern is this, for 99% of the Measure D funding plan, the allocation of the various funds to the rail trail, Highway 1, et cetera, is based on a percentage of the total revenue. This means that as inflation goes up, sales tax revenue increases too, and so do those allocations. This is why revenues are above projections for each category that receives funding based on that formula. But that is not the case for the Highway 9 funds. For some reason, instead of a percentage of revenue, this category receives a fixed allocation of $10 million over the 30-year period. In the past seven years since the measure was passed, that allocation has lost 20% of its purchasing power, $2 million because of inflation. The commission has, has chosen to interpret the measure to mean that the amount has to be spread out evenly over 30 years. I disagree with that decision and I believe it can be changed. If the allocation of $10 million is spread over 30 years as planned because of inflation, the spending power will end up being less than $4 million in 2016 dollars by the time uh, that the period is up. And I don't think that's fair or what was intended by the voters. I urge the commission to fast track the allocation of revenue to Highway 9 and invest now in the many excellent projects RTC staff have advanced in that area that are ready to go. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Largay. All right, seeing no one else with their hand raised uh, online, they, I'll return it to the commission. Uh, before I take a motion, there's just a couple of questions that came up uh, during some of the public comment that I'd like to ask staff to address. Um, and also one that just in reviewing the expenditure plan occurred to me. The first is um, going back to the rail category. I see that we budgeted for the uh, passenger rail EIR concept report, um, but not for uh, the completion of the passenger rail EIR sort of phase two, if you will. Um, does that mean that we are anticipating applying for state grants to for, for that funding or how do, would we go about getting funds to complete the passenger rail EIR? You want me Take to go? It? <laughs> go for it. Senior transportation engineer, Sarah Christensen, yes. Thank you. Um, Excuse me. So uh, the passenger rail project um, is not fully funded, obviously. Even the concept, the concept report and the AIR together, um, we've discussed many times, we just awarded the contract for HDR to get going on the concept report, but we have a long road ahead to fully fund the EIR. We have applied for the RTC consolidated grant um, funding that's available uh, for regional projects. Um, and um, we're hoping to fully fund the AR through that process. Um, and um, just to reiterate, I think what we've talked about a lot of times is competitive grants very rarely uh, fund pre-construction. And it's it's rare that there's that opportunity. We were lucky to get some TERSIP funds, the uh, competitive funds. We asked for 16 million. We got 3.45 million. Um, if we continue to pursue fund, you know, the competitive funding that is available for pre-construction, which is few and far between, um, hopefully it's not a, you know, continuing pattern, but it is very challenging. And a lot of the local agencies are um, expected to fund a lot of the pre-construction activities. Um, and so um, just wanted to put that on your radar and um, we'll, I'm sure, talk more about it at the next commission meeting. And there, there is one grant that we are eyeballing. It's uh, state rail assistance funding for emerging corridors. Um, like uh, Sarah mentioned, um, it's very unusual to be able to get funding for pre-construction. Um, this account um, only has about $30 million in it statewide, and we need about 20. So we're not going to get it all from that. Um, we're going to have to leverage. We're not going to leverage at five to one, but if we can get some of that offset, that would be a good thing. 
Um, that call has not gone out yet. We don't know exactly what's going to what's going to be in there, what the parameters are going to be. Um, so right now, I think it makes sense to kind of hold off on Measure D towards it. We'll see um, next month on the consolidated call uh, for projects what the the commission wants to do. It may make sense even holding off then and waiting for the call for projects. And like I mentioned earlier, the um, the, the strategic plan and even the five-year plans can be amended at any time. And so once we have that information, we can certainly come back and make the best decision as to how to capture some of that state funding. Can I follow up? Can I add one more tiny bit about um, the fact that that tiny pot of money um, also needs to cover any kind of uh, infrastructure repairs. And so um, it's wise not to completely empty out our pockets to try to deliver, you know, this very ambitious capital project if we could help it, because we are balancing a few other um, issues that are uh, putting strain on the capacity of Measure D rail category. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Commissioner Rockin. I'm being interested in a little expansion of the discussion of that gap we're talking about um, in, in funding the pre-construction costs. Um, when this was before us earlier, we realized we had a gap. And unless I'm really forgetting, we're talking like, I thought, three to six million dollar gap maybe or something. Now it's 20. Um, could I get a little more information to sort of understand what, why, how come we're that Am I right that there's been some change in our estimate for how much the gap is between what we have and what we need? There, there has been a, some changes, but it hasn't been that to that extent. Um, we, um, we estimated that the environmental document was going to cost about $16 million originally. Uh, with staff time and after um, procuring a consultant and negotiating with them about um, the actual costs and looking at their numbers and the scope of work, um, the estimates have gone up to just north of 20 million. Um, we have uh, the concept report fully funded, which is about seven, and, uh, and we're going to need about $20 million more to fully fund the consultant's work and staff time to produce an environmental document with 15% plans. That's not all the pre-construction work. That would give us an environmental document and essentially project approval. And then at that point, where we would have fairly decent cost estimates about what the whole project is going to cost. Um, and we would have to bring additional local funds to the table to be able to um, leverage um, all of the funding that would be needed to actually build and operate a, a passenger rail system. Thank you. Uh, and then another question that was raised by the public um, about the five to one match to restore the rail line um, and needing, you know, approximately $60 million to um, you know, restore freight service for the majority aligned. Um, is there a reason that we can't, are, are there state grants that we're not pursuing or could pursue um, in order to match our local money and, and create or, or uh, pursue more fixes on the freight line faster? So those grants are competitive grants, and um, they look at performance measures when um, deciding who to award those grants to. So when you're applying for a grant for a federal rail bridge uh, replacement, let's say, um, they're going to look at how much freight traffic you have on the line to see what the benefits are. Um, we can certainly apply for it, but without any freight traffic on the line, I don't think that we would be successful on a uh, securing that funding when we're competing against projects like the Port of Oakland, the rail lines that go in and out of there and whatnot. Our best chance to restore this rail line for rail service is through passenger rail. And there's a lot of money out there for passenger rail service. Uh, that's why we are proceeding with the concept report. And then ultimately we will move forward with an environmental impact report. Um, and uh, if we uh, choose to move forward with that project, um, replacement of those bridges and that capital infrastructure could likely be funded by uh, the benefits uh, associated with um, uh, passenger rail service in the future. And um, we are also uh, taking the strategy of the remaining segments of the trail being a component of that project and, and working to try and uh, to deliver what the commission has directed us to do, which is to consider both rail and trail on the line. Thank you. 
Commissioner Montesino. Yeah, I'd like to move staff recommendation. Second. All right, great. We have a motion from Commissioner Montesino, second from Commissioner Schiffer uh, for the staff recommendation. Any further discussion? Commissioner Johnson? Just um, kind of parenthetically, um, I really found it interesting. And this, uh, in, in many ways, the, the discussion with, that this um, body has is about funding, about funds, <clears throat> money that's spent, where it's spent, and so forth. Um, you know, a few, about an hour ago, we were singing the praises of Guy Preston about how wise he was. And um, in June of 2022, uh, his initial recommendations about rail banking um, were made evident. He changed that, and I, I uh, honor that. But we also heard just now that rail banking serves the purpose of eliminating impediments of in terms of easements and all the future impediments that probably could occur that would be very, very expensive. And yet, almost out of hand, uh, that analysis was rejected because certain groups want this or that or that. You know, as, as a representative of my city, um, in many ways, the discussion of ultimate versus temporary or whatever, uh, we don't really have a, a true dog in that hunt in many ways. I mean, my focus is always a wise use of funds because we don't want to go in the wrong directions and all of a sudden keep having to continually come up with subsidies and money that may, may not be well spent. So. You know, the interpretation of Measure D and the 74%, again, uh, with, without having, you know, further um, study of why people voted the way they do, a lot of it had to do with the fact that Roaring Camp came in and, you know, the people of my city, probably many of them, just heard that Roaring Camp is in danger and we're not going to support Measure D. So, um, you know, I just want to kind of put that out there um, in, in terms of, you know, uh, a, a perspective of being open to solutions, you know, and, you know, open to arguments and facts and so forth. And so, you know, again, my, I, I don't have a, 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 a solid opinion on the, the trail, the rail or whatever, just in terms of how efficacious it would be, what benefits it would be, but I just want to make sure that we're spending the money wisely. Parenthetically. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. We have a five-year plan to do that, which as has been noted, could be changed at um, a future time if so desired by this commission. So if there's no further comments, all those in favor? Oh, correct. Thank you. Um, Clerk, will you please call uh, a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Yes. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commission Alternate Pegler? Aye. And Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And, uh, Apologies for the extended discussion on that, but as you can see clearly, Guy, we just want to get uh, all of the knowledge out of your head possible before you leave us. So I'll apologize for that. I mean, those are it's true. Uh, not, thank you for the vibrant discussion. Thanks for the correction. Um, all right, then I'll move on with item 24, which is amendments to the fiscal year 23-24 budget and work program. And for a presentation on this item, we have our director of budget and finance. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Tracy New um, of RTC staff here today to present an amendment to the Regional Transportation Commission's budget and work program and the Measure D budget. Earlier this year in April, the Commission adopted a preliminary budget based on projections available at the time from the County Auditor, State Controller's Office, and Hinder Leiter Delamas, our consultant. In June, the RTC approved an amended budget to account for carryover for work planned in fiscal year 22-23 that was extended to fiscal year 23-24 based on updated revenue forecasts and project status. The proposed budget today, um, presented today focuses on continued implementation of previously approved projects and have been adjusted to reflect updated revenue forecasts, prior expenditures, updated project costs, and schedules. Pro proposed updates to the five-year plans were approved as part of the previous item. 
Highlighted from the proposed budget amendment are two new planning grants totaling $648,160 for the Santa Cruz County North Coast Transportation Demand Management Planning Grant led by Senior Transportation Planner Grace Blakesley and the Santa Cruz Rural Highway Safety Plan led by Transportation Planner Brianna Goodman. Also, a projected 1% decrease from the 22-23 actuals for Measure D revenues is incorporated into this budget and the five-year plans that were approved. The Budget and Administration Personnel Committee met on October 12th to consider the proposed budget presented in the staff report. The committee did not have a quorum. The staff did present the budget and the committee members who participated in the committee meeting did not have any object objections and expressed their support for the amendment. Also included in this item is a student intern salary schedule. The salary schedule is intended to help the RTC be competitive in recruiting student interns for planning, engineer, and communications. Staff recommends that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission adopt the attached resolution, attachment one, approving the proposed fiscal year 23-24 RTC budget and work program and measure D budget as shown on exhibit A of attachment one and approve the proposed salary schedule for student intern positions. Thank you very much, Director New. Are there comments or questions from directors or commissioners? Seeing none, is there any member of the public who wishes to comment on this item? Anyone here in chambers? Anyone online? All right. I'll move the staff recommendation. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Schifrin. And, uh, to say we had a, a full discussion at our limited budget administration meeting and staff answered all the questions that the attendees had. And I, I think uh, if there had been a quorum, it would have been a recommendation from the committee to approve the staff recommendation, so. All right, motion from Commissioner Schaefer, second by Commissioner Rotkin. Uh, there's no further discussion. Uh, yes, Commissioner Sandy Brown. I just wanted to say thank you for the very clear uh, document, the agenda report. Um, it caused me to not have questions here for you right now um, because and it was it was really helpful uh, to, as you highlighted the, the key changes and kind of laid it out very clearly. So thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Sandy Brown. And if there are no further comments, clerk, if you could please uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Montesino. Aye. Commissioner Hernandez. Yes. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn. Aye. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Pegler. Aye. And Commissioner Rotkin. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director New. Uh, the Commission will now move into closed session. Uh, and Council, will there be any reportable actions coming out of closed session? Um, we're not anticipating any reportable actions today. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that ends the um, current public meeting and the uh, commission will now move into closed session in the uh, room to my right. Thank you, everybody.